And again, that makes it harder for you to use all that potential energy to get it turned back into acid later on. Any questions? Sir. Uh, with lithium batteries, uh, uh, they, I don't think the, uh, the VMS in a lithium battery goes into its balance mode until the voltage is up, up high. Yeah, so he, he's asking about the, the VMSs and balancing the cells. Now, prior to working with Blue Sky Energy, same owner, I built about a thousand batteries for these earthquake sensors up in Alaska. Because Jenison used to manufacture lithium batteries for a lot of high-end yachts and stuff like that. And he's quite correct that most lithium batteries, the vast majority, do what's called top balancing. So they're not going to equalize the cell voltages until you get it to a particular charge voltage. Normally that'd be about 14.2 at the battery. And so a lot of times, and that's my preferred charge voltage or balancing voltage for a lithium battery. So that's my personal favorite, 14.2. Now you have to realize there might be some resistance between your charge controller and your battery. There's always some resistance, but depending on your wire gauge, distance, the current, you know, you want to make sure it's 14.2 at the battery. That might make you to a 14.3 at the charge controller just to account for that. Um, and also when you charge a lithium battery, once you achieve that balancing voltage, it's pretty much charged. I mean, you're in the 90 plus percentile, depending on how imbalanced your cells may be. Unlike a lead acid battery, we're charging 20 amps, 20 amps, 20 amps. You get the absorption, it's like 19 amps, 19 amps, 17 amps, 17 amps. If you, if you look at the uh, lithium battery, you're going to charge at 20 amps, 20 amps, 20 amps. And as soon as you get to 14, too, it's like half an amp, like next to nothing. And then, it's, then at that point, it's balancing the cells. Because unlike a lead acid battery, as you charge the battery, the cells don't come up at the same voltage at the same time. If you look at the charge profile of a lithium battery, they call it the hockey stick because it goes like, uh, then wham, at the end. And as, as you get to the end of that hockey stick, this cell can jump up and this cell can be a little slower, even though your series voltage is still 14.2, you know, you, this, this cell is higher than that one. And so you need a little time to balance those cells. Uh, another benefit of lithium batteries is they don't care if they remain discharged. Um, in fact, if you store your lithium battery for long term, the book says you should discharge it about 30 to 40% and leave it in a discharged state for that long period of time. You don't want to fully charge your lithium battery and then stash it, you know, for the summer or the winter, depending on, you know, what season you have. You want to discharge it a little bit. Um, I've got a lithium battery from that the project I did. It's about five years old. It's still sitting in my closet, brand new. It's only charged 30%. In fact, when you ship a lithium battery, that's the legal, that's only the legal state of charge you're allowed to ship them at, about 30% in order to, uh, you know, obey all the laws and stuff like that. How much, how much balancing time should we typically allow? Uh, the, the amount of balancing time is a little dependent on the BMS and of course how imbalanced the cells are, but it ranges from 12 minutes to one hour, depending on the, whom, whom you ask. Battleborn will say one hour per battery. You know, lithionics will say 12 minutes, you know, is more than enough. Some people sit, will say it's better not to balance the batteries every time, but at the same time, that way you're not like, you know, you're not stressing the cells and only balance them every two weeks. But that's one of those things where opinions really vary depending on who you ask. And I'm not going to say one person's right and one person's wrong. Normally when I recommend a balancing time, I recommend about a half an hour. Um, and, but that depends a lot on the balance and the cells. Because as you match the cells, their, their columbic efficiency, that makes a big difference on how much of their balance time. So a lot of it is a TLC that people use to build a particular battery. Because it's not just, you're not like a good cell, a bad cell, but to match the cells together so that charge rate on that particular cell is really, you know, in, in tune with each other. But uh, I always say about a half an hour. Other people would say 15 minutes. Battleborn will say one hour per battery. So if you have two batteries, they want two hours. But to each their own, you know. I'll, I'll be happy to let you program whatever you want. You know, I'm not going to say which is right and which is wrong. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, when you're balancing a lead acid battery, you're basically just forcing the electrons through the good cells so you charge up the weaker ones. But a, yeah. so there's no special circuitry. Uh, lithium battery, I think there's some circuitry in the battery so that you don't damage the good cells. Can you describe what that? Well, yeah. Inside the lithium battery, you've got your battery management system, your BMS. But your BMS does a few things. It, we, like we discussed, it'll balance the cells' voltages once you reach your charge voltage. So in the end, there will be even, Steve, at 3.55 to 3.65 volts per cell. The other things a lithium uh, battery management system can do or should has to do is it makes sure your battery, your lithium battery, doesn't get discharged below a certain point. 
Um, if you look at the discharge curve on a ba lithium battery, it's like hockey stick, really stable. I'm off the <laughs> hockey stick, and it just falls off the map. Now, when you, with a lithium cell, if you discharge it below a certain point, you need to charge it really slowly, or else it explodes. And so, what a DMS does is it cuts off your 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 battery from any loads preventing your cells from getting to that low voltage where it would be dangerous to charge them at a high rate. Um, the other thing a lithium battery DMS does would be to disconnect the battery if the voltage gets too high. You know, so there's another danger lithium batteries. You don't want to overcharge the cells. So if you charge it past 14.6, disconnect voltage vary, but normally about 14.8, it'll also disconnect any charge current going to the battery. Also a good BMS is also going to monitor the temperature of the individual cells because you don't want to get columbic runaway. If a, a lithium battery cell shorts, for lack of a better term, it's going to start generating a ton of heat and it, it can get dangerous. So most lithium batteries will also have temperature sensors on each individual cell just for protection purposes. And then if you have a really good lithium battery DMS, you don't want to charge a lithium battery below freezing. You can discharge it below freezing, but you can't ever charge it if the battery is below zero degrees Celsius. And so a good BMS will also monitor the, the error in the cell temperature and disconnect charge charge sources if the, the battery is below zero degrees just for safety's sake. Now, if your BMS doesn't have that feature or you want to charge your batteries when it's super cold, they do make some, some, something called battery blankets. And that would fit like it's like an electric blanket you put around your batteries. And if it gets below zero C, it'll drain a little bit of the batteries, use a little bit of power to keep them above zero C. So there are a lot of stuff on the market in order to combat the zero degree thing. I mean, also on a lead acid battery, you never want to charge a frozen battery, right? But the freezing point of a lead acid battery is a lot uh, lower if it's fully charged. That's why people more or less, you know, if they're parking the car in the mountains and it's, you know, below freezing, you don't woke up, you don't wake up to a frozen battery. It's because you have a lot of acid still in there. And so it's freezing point is much lower. If you have a fully discharged lead acid battery, and you put it you know, in sub-zero temperature, well, yeah, it, it can freeze up. And in that situation, the same. You don't want to try to charge it because it can get dangerous. Yes, sir. Uh, your definition of, uh, of a lithium battery, you may have said, is it a LiPo or a LiPo? Uh, it's a good question. He's asking uh, the, the chemistries of the lithium batteries. Now, the just about all the large capacity batteries, right, are lithium iron phosphate or LIFO4, L-I-F-E-P-O-4, right? And that's gonna be common. So any of these like Battleborns or Relyon, they're always gonna be lithium iron phosphates. The other chemistry is lithium cobalt slash lithium, lithium manganese or lithium polymer. So the kind, of, the kind of lithium technology you have in your phone or for most of the like electric bikes or those scooter thingy dingies and all that, those are lithium ion, L-I-ion, which is referring to the category of you know, the 18650 cells, the Sanyo 18650 cells mostly. And they look like a little double A's. They stack a bunch together and they don't get as many charge cycles, nearly, nearly as many charge cycles. And they're also a little more dangerous. Those are the ones that can catch on fire. You could take a LiPo4, lithium iron phosphate, and you could toss it in the campfire. It's not gonna burn, right? It's gonna stink, it's gonna make a mess, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna cause this big fire. Now it's not the same with lithium Li-ion, lithium manganese, lithium cobalt, lithium polymer. Those have a, a lot of potential energy and they're not as safe. So really, unless you're, you're talking about an electric scooter, electric bike, or something that, something like that, you can just assume it's a LiPo4. You know, anything over 20 amp hours is pretty much guaranteed to be a lithium iron phosphate and not the uh, Li-ion. But there's a lot of confusion out there. I've seen a lot of people describe lithium iron phosphate as Li-ion and vice versa. And so you want to make sure you know what you're getting. But I wouldn't be too concerned about getting the wrong one. Because unless you're getting something off eBay or Alibaba, you know, you're not, you know, any reputable site is going to, you know, steer you the right way. But you will do want LiPo4, L-I-F-E-P-O-4, lithium iron phosphate, definitely. Any questions? Woohoo! Alright. Well, you turn out do a little bit more lithium, uh, lithium batteries here and move on. I also want to cover a lot of like the troubleshooting. For Blue Sky Energy and Jenison, I do product support, which means all day, every day, people call me with problems. I do want to cover some of those some of those items before we get going, because I want to make sure if your system's not working right, you know, you can always help troubleshoot, of course, always happy to call me. 
Um, one more thing I'll talk about lithium batteries is the, the capacity. Just like we talked about on a lead acid battery, you really don't want to discharge it below 60%, about 12 volts, because it's hard on the battery. That means if you have a 100 amp hour battery, you really have about 60 amp hours effective that you can use out of that 100 amp hour battery, if you can only discharge it like 60%. And the lithium batteries, you can use about 80 to 90% of its capacity. That means if you have two batteries, they're both 100 amp hours, the lead acid, you got 60 to work with, and the lithium, you got 80 or 90 to work with. So your, the, the effective amp hours, the amp hours you can use. So it's just something to take into consideration. I know everybody's getting really excited about the lithium market, and so are we. And if, you, if you're if you counting how many amp hours you have now and how many amp hours you want in equivalent as lithium, keep that in mind. Also, lithium batteries are a little more efficient when you charge them. Um, when you charge a battery, it always takes some power to make that chemical reaction happen. It's called the Pukert's factor. So when you charge a lead acid battery, you pretty much keep about nine and a half, 9.4 amps for every 10 amps you give it. It's got about a 92, 94% charge efficiency. And lithium batteries are more like 99%. So you are gonna get about 7% more power into your lithium battery, just because there's a lot less resistance to make the chemical reaction happen within it. Another thing, so you, for example, you have you know, X number of watts of solar, that's gonna be a more efficient when charging your lithium battery, because there's less resistance within the battery to, uh, you know, to make that chemical reaction happen. Um, also with a lithium battery, if you have a lithium battery system and you don't have a battery monitor, like our IPN Pro remote with the current shunt, I really do recommend them. Because I spoke a little earlier about how stable the lithium battery voltages are, and you really don't get any like, warning when, you're, when your battery's gonna cut off on you. It's gonna, it's gonna be like, you know, 12.8, 12.8, 12.8, 12.8, I'm off, <laughs> you know? Unlike a lead acid battery, you can see, oh, my batteries are getting down to 12.2, maybe I should turn on the Jenny. You know, so you really want a battery monitor that's going to take into account all like our IPN Pro Remote display that monitors all that current going in and out. But now you have actual state of charge information based on amp hours. Out of 200 amp hours, I've got 190 left. You know, I'm 96% charged. That becomes a lot more important when you have a you know lithium battery as compared to a lead acid battery. You know, that he asked, the, you know, what about vibration on lithium batteries versus lead acid? Truth be told, mm, you know, I guess it's going to depend on the particular um, lithium battery manufacturer. I haven't, I haven't ever heard of any going bad in that fashion, but obviously you've got electronics inside a battery, and that's a lot of the TLC on how the particular one is built. I haven't heard anybody going bad that in that way, but I'm also not an installer you know, in general, so I don't have customers going back to me and saying, hey, my battery's not broken, you know? I have heard good things about support for most of the popular brands, like Earth Battleborn's got good support, or Line. I've never heard of bad support for any of these lithium batteries, and I'm sure customer service and product support of those guys can help you out. And you can mail a lithium battery. They can, you can go UPS with a lithium battery. It's not like it's got a, it is to consider, still considered hazmat, but it's not like you can't just put it in a box and go. So I'm sure if uh, you do need to warranty one of those, you can just mail it out to the manufacturer um, versus, you know, driving it there for whoever it is, you know. Any other questions so far? Yes, sir. Well, I mean, I don't want to speak one brand versus another, right? You can discharge a battery until it cuts out. Now, I can say I have experimented with the Battleborn battery, the Dragonfly version of the Battleborn. And I, I, and I basically, you know, put a five amp load on it. I put my watt meter on it. This is one of the, this is for an African project we were doing in solar in Africa. Woo! Um, but I wanted to, we wanted to test the capacity and more specifically the voltages of the battery. So we wanted to keep, you know, if we wanted to have a disconnect voltage. We wanted to save a few amp hours for standby power. So I cycled the Dragonfly version of Battleborns several times, and sure enough, 100 amp hours out before it cut off every single time. Of course, that's going to be a little dependent on your loads as far as the voltage stack. If you have a 20 amp load on a battery, its voltage is going to be lower than if you have a 5 amp load on a battery, just because of the, the pressure that when you're drawing battery, that this, and this air pressure is going to be low. So if the battery is based in its cutoff point on voltage, yeah, you might not get 100 amp hours if you're drawing 50 amps of it, but on a modest load, I can say at least on the, the Dragonfly Battleborn, it was 100, it was 100, it was 100 when it cut off. I found that at a 5 amp load, their disconnect voltages didn't quite agree with um, what I was observing as far as the state of charge left. 
and so we played with it a few more times. And I'll be happy if you need to know uh, like an LVD cutoff switch for the Dragonfly, I'll be happy to you know forward you what I discovered on my personal testing versus that. But that again, that could have just been a load difference. They might have had a one amp load on their battery, and that would affect you know the cutoff voltage versus the capacity or the state of charge of the battery where it was left. But it was consistent, and I did get 100 amp hours out of it every single time before it turned off. So I was impressed. Any questions? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, just uh, a couple other advantages of lithium that have gone over the weight. Most of us put batteries on the uh, on the tuck, and the weight is going to be uh, uh, one third to one half of uh, the equivalent. Uh, uh, well, in fact, even less if we're looking at uh, actual current capacity. Yeah, I agree. He's he was asking or making the comment of you know lithium batteries are lighter. Ooh, they're a lot lighter. You know, they're talking um, about a quarter to a third of the weight of a, a lead acid battery. So I completely agree with that. Um, you know, and also they have higher energy density. So if you look at the form fact, most of them. But if you look at the well, they all they do have higher density. But depending on the enclosure they use, you look at the form factor. For example, if you're keeping one battery underneath your step and that's the only place you can put batteries, you're going to get away with more amp hours underneath that step with a lithium battery. Also, like I mentioned, you know, if you have a 100 amp hour lithium, you've got about 80 to 90 to work with before you, you know, you're, you're on the tail end of the hockey stick. If you've got a 100 amp hour lead acid battery, you've got about 60, 65 to work with before you start damaging it. So not only is it more compact as far as energy density, you get to utilize more amp hours out of the particular, of that, of that you know, you have more you have more more energy need more power in there to use any other questions okay here's my favorite one <laughs> Here, here's the great debate series versus parallel 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 <laughs> which is better now I'm, I'm not going to say one's better than the other i just want to describe the benefits pros and cons of the two different setups okay and then everybody can make their own choices now um when you combine two panels together, and for this example, I'm just gonna be talking about a 12 volt, 36 cell, 18 volts under load power. Uh, standard, like we had a 100 watt panel, you have 18 volts under load, it's gonna give you about five amps, five and a half, five amps, just call it five for easy reference, right? Now, if I have two panels connected in parallel, you know, connect the reds together, connect the back, blacks together, doubling the current, keeping the voltage the same, right? If I take one panel alone and I put my hand over it, its output voltage is going to go from 18 to like 17, maybe 16 and a half. You're going to lose about 7%, depending on how big your hand is, of course, and how close you get to the sun. But you're going to lose about 7% of your panel's output voltage of that, right? But that, that same panel, I put my hand over it, its output current, or its IMP, amps max power, is going to drop down to like two and a half. Now, if I combine two panels together in parallel, basically the lowest voltage tries to dominate. So now, if I, you know, this one's at, you know, 18 volts, I put my hand over it, it's 17 and a half, you know, 16 and a half. Now this one's 16 and a half. Now that's not 100% accurate. I mean, each panel can only draw so much power or load from the other panels. So I don't want to say that's going to be a total, but it's a little bit like combining two batteries together. If you have a fully charged battery and you've got a dead battery and you connect them together, you're going to have a dead battery, right? The voltage is going to pour into that lower battery. The higher voltage is going to charge into the lower voltage. So when you combine a, a, a panel in parallel, um, the lowest voltage will try to dominate. So for example, as far as voltage goes, you know, this, this, this panel, you know, yeah, its current still dropped to two and a half, but since its voltage dropped to 16 and a half and lost 7%, I'm only losing about 7% of this other panel. Now, when you combine two panels in series, you're basically doubling the voltage, you're tying together like two six volt batteries and the current remains the same. And when panels are connected in series, the lowest current dominates. So now if I put my hand over this panel and it's down to two and a half amps, its buddy's down to two and a half amps too. It bottlenecks that current. So now in series, instead of losing 7% of my power, right, I'm losing 50% of my power. So there's no arguments that partial shading, when it comes to partial shading of an array, the parallel is always gonna win. Now there are some caveats. A lot of new panels these days have integrated bypass diodes, which means if you have three panels and you shade one and it's trying to bottleneck the current, the, the power will flow right around it, so it doesn't take down your entire array. You, but you'd still lose that entire panel as the bypass diode, you know, is active. So there are, you know, it's not like 
most panels these days, a lot of the modern ones, do have bypass diodes. And they can help when you put all these series strings together and from, 